Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series on Hegel's lectures on the his on the his lectures on world history. Yes, we are continuing our um, chapter now on China, and this is going to be the second episode concerning China. And we are going to start with the section titled "The Main Elements in Chinese History." All right. Yeah. Yeah. So we were just saying before we started recording that uh, it's a bit thin around the conceptual waste this section. <laughs> it is indeed. Uh, I mean, I guess from an anecdotal perspective, it's interesting to see how much Hegel, how much information Hegel has amassed about the ancient Chinese empire, its origins, its development. Um, the editors of these lectures cite two main works that Hegel seems to be referring to repeatedly. Yeah. I guess that's just it's interesting to know that Hegel is drawing on the historical work of other German scholars who've written on this and has spent so much time learning it in, in preparation for the lectures. Oh, yeah. Well, he didn't have much of an option, right? He could either read accounts made by others or other scholars, right? Or yeah. he'd go over there himself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the main elements. Yeah, you were going to say something. Well, in contrast to many, you know, other famed big philosophers, Hegel did travel a little bit. You know, he wasn't like Kant yeah. stuck in Königsberg all his life. He, <laughs> yeah. he moved around, but not for for this for this one. No, no, he didn't go as far as China. <laughs> so I guess I mean for me, the first really significant point comes on page two twenty, uh, in the beginning of the the second paragraph where Hegel sort of makes the point again that Chinese history involves few external relationships and accordingly these relationships offer little in the way of anything universal. So he's really repeating this aspect of the immediacy of, uh, of China. And again, just echoing what was said in the previous episode on China, where Hegel was, I think, where we, we we sort of uh, agreed that Hegel was doing that there as well. Uh, this seems to be a significant aspect of of uh, of China for Hegel as the mm -hmm. first stage in world history that it has this form of immediacy yeah. and it's entirely self um, self relating in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's internally developing, right? What China, yeah. ancient China had in terms of its society and statehood it developed through itself right yeah. so in a way it sort of set out its own traditions and institutions and all of that which i think leads into why he later talks about how conquerors kind of failed to integrate with the rest of the chinese society interesting right? yeah right because they had to establish new cities elsewhere from the other uh, major hubs or uh, traditional capitals, they established new ones, and they segregated themselves away from the um, their subjects. Yeah, which well, su yeah. suggests to me their inca incapacity of, of integrating with the Chinese, or if it or, or of the Chinese kind of being difficult to integrate with, right? Yeah, maybe because they have this rich developed history. Uh, of their own that's a really good way to make sense of that because i was wondering why are we reading about the movement of capitals every time <laughs> china's been conquered by a, a foreign invader but that's yeah. a very nice reading of it yes um i was also asking myself why is hegel talking about the government struggle with the rivers and marshlands just a bit further up but before uh -huh. we talk about the movement of capitals yeah and i didn't think it was related to this thing to the immediacy of china it just it struck me as some kind of note on you know how this kind of bureaucratic activity requires a big state and it requires organization and this is the kind of thing you would expect from one of the nations in world history. 
that it's struggling to control the environment around it and to bend it to its will and to try and use it as effectively as possible for its own prosperity. Yeah, I suppose that's, uh, you know, it's the geography is a factor for all states. And it's yeah. kind of the, the the zero level point at which just the, the thing a state has to deal with immediately. And despite ancient China having a lot of um, bonuses in terms of where they start, right? A lot of things that uh, facilitate um, rapid development such that they can spend time working on institutions and history and so on instead of having to focus everything on food. There is still nonetheless some part of the geography that does need quite a bit of work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And maybe like large scale work. Right. You imagine, and then he talks about canals and he talks about the building of the Great Wall of China. And he doesn't really explain why he's mentioning all these things, but you get the impression that he's pointing at the scale of organization of the state of the state yeah well um, yeah pre previously we were thinking about how the land facilitates and offers opportunities for uh the people living there mm -hmm. such that if the you know the land is tough or or stuff like that it's going to be hard to develop a sophisticated state you know over there um mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why we have um, ancient states in the way we know them is because that there was something in the geography that aided them in that development, sort of helped them out, made things easier that were elsewhere more difficult. But what we flip it around and also think that, well, some, some things um, are not easy, are actually incredibly hard, but can be sort of unlocked with enough organization and tech technological advancement mm -hmm. so that for anyone else living in, in a certain area, they would be totally impoverished. But with people coming in with the kind of right insight and organization and technology, they might just turn things around and turn that place into a kind of like a really bountiful and easy place to live. But it right. required that step of large scale organization. Right, yeah, which you might think requires a state which recognizes itself as a state, a uh, people that recognize itself as a people. Yeah, which is one because of just that... because of large scale organization requires exactly. that. You know, if you are dealing with hundreds and thousands of people working at something in the concert, yes, there must be some state organization. I think at that level, otherwise, yeah. it just wouldn't happen, right? Exactly, yeah. Right, so that's that's kind of how I understood this sort of section, uh, with the exception maybe of all the, yeah, pretty much this section, as Hegel giving us examples of the organization of the state and sort of they're leaving their mark on their environment and on their neighbors and, yeah. And he yeah. concludes the section by saying, so the history is a history of emperors and their households. I mean, so part of me was wondering towards the end of this, to what extent we should be trying to find conceptual material in this thing. Maybe this is just an introduction into the main elements of history of China. So you just, you know, you're about to give someone a conceptual analysis of a topic and you're like, well, before we get into that, these are some of the, the main historical markers that you need to know about this topic before we get into it in more abstract terms. Yes, the preface needs a preface. Maybe it's just that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, although I, I think the next section does have more conceptual meat. Yes. Uh, but it really doesn't start shining until the very end. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of historical prep work Hegel does. Yeah. Uh, well, let's not forget as well that these these uh, headings are the editors. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, Hegel didn't sit down and write it as methodically as it might appear. These are lectures. Yeah. But the first sentence of the section is quite encouraging, right? Because he starts by saying, "Our more particular concern is to characterize the shape 
of Chinese civilization, more specifically as a shape of the state, as ethical. Yeah, so he's bringing us back into the the main subject of inquiry. We're concerned about identifying the ethical life of of China, which is what sort of the subject matter of world history. Yeah. And what do you know? It turns out to be uh, pretty patriarchal. Right. Yeah. So that's the first thing that he begins with. Yeah, the principle of the Chinese states rests wholly on patriarchal relationships. Yeah. It's like the Alpha and Omega. Yeah. And then a bit further down, it says the organization of the states is cultivated such that the family relationship is the foundation. It can be more precisely characterized as a moral foundation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder to what extent this was an implicit criticism of the of the Chinese state, um, insofar as for Hegel, family is not meant to be uh, the foundation. I mean, the end of the state, the organization of the state shouldn't be around the family. It should be around uh civil society right in the philosophy of right the family is a moment of it well in the in the philosophy of right the family is a moment of it but civil society is also a moment of it and the state itself is a moment of it even though at the end of the day i think the state has kind of ultimacy Mm -hmm. Uh, but family still has a logical primacy right yeah you get the impression that it's just family life yeah sure uh, here in, it's, uh, in yeah. china and you don't have the civil society part no which must be implicitly uh, a negative even though hegel doesn't really say it, it... yes and i th- but i think this is also a very common thing among all chinese uh, ancient uh, societies okay just thinking uh, you know thinking off the top of my head about the egyptians the, the greeks and the romans you know, the dad was a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's uh, what I think, I think this is a f- very familiar aspect in ancient Chinese society mm-hmm. for us. Okay. Uh, good. Well, it's good to keep an eye on that then as we go through the different uh, civilizations. Yeah, so we, then... we can see, we can see, we can keep that in mind as we, you know, venture through the next one, see how much, patri- how much patriarchy there is. <laughs> so i mean and then so this is in section one so section one of yeah characteristics of the chinese state is hegel giving an account of the um this uh patriarchal relationship and he talks a lot about the relationship between children and their elders the relationship of parents to children in particular and all these sort of familial ties and the kinds of restrictions that exist yeah and i guess one gets the impression that it's quite restrictive uh there isn't much room for individual freedom you might think Mm -hmm. Uh, hegel doesn't say that explicitly so far but that's the that's the uh, that's sort of the feeling you get from Mm. the points that he's highlighting uh yeah. Yeah, it's uh, pretty striking that he says children have no possessions of their own. They are perpetual minors, must serve their elders, care for them, be deferential to them, and must mourn them for a long period after they are pe- after they are gone. Right. So there is, you know, it's it's patriarchy plus seniority to uh, the utmost extreme. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, if the kids don't really have a voice of their own as long as their dad is still around, even if they become dads themselves, they are still beholden to their own dad. Yeah, exactly. And I think we shall see later on that their dad is also beholden to something else. So, right. Yeah. There isn't really any individualism or independence at any stage. There is maybe more for the father. But not so much. Maybe. It might just be yeah. a relative independence. Yeah. Um, okay. 
Should we go to the second topic then? Well, you don't want to discuss concubines? <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> In so, China, so, polygamy so, is not allowed. No. Uh, but you can't have concubines. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. The husband, however, can own several concubines who are servants to the true wife. Yes. Right. And and the children of the concubines are viewed as children of the legitimate wife. That's right. Yeah. But interestingly, these children cannot mourn their biological mothers. They can only mourn their true wife. Yes. Their adopted mother, I suppose, would be. Yeah, the 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 father's legitimate wife. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's funny how. Um, there is a lot of spirit uh, coming into to the family at this level because we see a pretty clear separation between what's regarded as morally right and what's you know of nature. Mm -hmm. So even though there might be reasons why you cannot have children with your legitimate wife, well, that's no reason why you cannot have children as such. Mm -hmm. Or we can think of you know children with other somebody else being the children of this legitimate wife right so there is an externality here that is being introduced where whatever happens in the natural domain is kind of devalued and hollowed out and what really matters is the spiritual uh interpretation of the matter at hand okay yes that's a very good point so the fact that the society has made room for the fact that it's not just about having children with the legitimate wife, but being able to fulfill that goal through multiple wives. Yeah. That spirit sort of overcoming the natural domain. Um, I would say so, yeah. Okay. I wouldn't say overcoming, but it's it's inserting itself in, in mm -hmm. that, right? Mm -hmm. It's putting up these seemingly arbitrary barriers for no no you don't get to mourn for this person only you have you have to be you know be a part you know this is your real mother uh, this is your actual mother not your real mother biological mother right right uh and this is sort of right okay that's really good yeah so the arbitrariness is the sign of spirit i think so yeah it has left its mark right good yeah and uh, we might also see this as a way of dealing with uh, adult adultery, right? Or excessive desires, right? Because that's a, always a rampant problem in all human societies. Like, mm -hmm. okay, if we want to institute a, I don't know, some sort of monogamous society, it perpetually fails. So how do mm -hmm. we deal with the, <laughs> the venting, the outflow? Well, let's <laughs> just, you know, br bring it under this umbrella thing, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah. And then I guess, okay, I mean, then just riffing off what you're doing now, there's this, there's this bit about uh, property as well. Yeah. Which seems to also bear the mark of spirit. Um, the idea is that the father alone has possessions, the children have none. Yep. The father has the legal right to sell the children as slaves. Yep. Uh, the son as well has the right to sell himself which I guess is a weird kind of self-determination, a weird little niche of self-determination in there. Yeah, but can he sell himself while being still, his, you know, his father being still alive? Because surely the father must decide whether or not he can sell himself. Uh, I don't know. The implication I get is that he can. Yeah, that seems like a uh, oversight. <laughs> Either on Hegel's part or in ancient China. Because that's an escape from the father, right? I could just sell myself <laughs> into slavery. Well, into slavery. I, don't, I yeah. don't know how much of an escape it is, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But I guess this idea again, right, that um, they're conceiving of things external to them as either belonging to someone, to the father, or not belonging to someone else. So there's a, you know, spirit is sort of embedding itself in the world around them in a very clearly defined way. 
Everyone yeah, yeah. knows what belongs to whom. Yes. And it's all very um, geared towards the center. Right. There is yeah. only one center in the family. <laughs> That's the father. Yeah. And they have, uh, you know, absolute uh, dominion. Precisely, yeah. And conversely, there is pretty harsh punishments for any wrongdoing on the part of a son or younger brother against an older brother. So yeah. if the young do anything against seniority, they're going to get it. Well, he says strangled. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. They're just yeah. like, whatever the, you know, the specifics are, the it's, it's not going to be pre pleasant. Yeah. So the harshest punishments are decreed for wrongs committed by family members against one another. And that's, I guess we should expect that. Again, it's this, it's this, the focus on this internal relationship. And I, I wonder if that mirrors the internality of the state that we've been speaking about, that um, just as the state has this constant looking inward aspect, so too on the lower levels, you have the family whose relations to each other are just always, it's just they're, they're, they're intensely self-relational mm -hmm. um such that you know people within the family are owned by the father if people misbehave within the family they're punished excessively for wronging the family yeah but that suggests to me that there isn't actually any real relationship between the father and the rest of the family the, well, all, formal, the whole family right? is just moments of the father basically yeah right yeah and if you pretend otherwise then we're gonna respond with force but the same thing th seems to be though right about for the state because if we zoom out these families seem to just be moments of the state yes um, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah 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 so we will we will see this pattern replicate yeah. itself at the level of the state exactly yeah yeah which makes sense uh in a way how uh, why things are like they are in the family because it is in a way a reflection of the state Exactly, yeah. So I guess that, that's a nice point that Hegel sort of makes that, that um, alludes to it. He doesn't make it explicitly, but he alludes to this reflection of the macro with the micro. Yeah, but I wonder if that is a bad thing because the family and the state should not be logically uh, like have parity, right. logical parity. They yeah. should be distinguished. There should be something different in the state vis-a-vis -vis the family. Yeah. Uh, but here there is a kind of very extreme mirroring going on between the two. And that, I think, might hint at a deficiency. Yeah. Well, he doesn't explicitly say anything. Not yet, at least. But, yeah, if we were to draw from the philosophy of right, I think there is an implicit criticism going on here. Hmm. Well, against the moderns, of course. <laughs> of course yeah yeah and then there's the stuff about graves and burials mm -hmm. which is a, uh, I guess another a further maybe more extreme point to highlight the the kinds of restrictions that the family imposes on someone um, so not only does the father own you not only can you not commit any wrong against your family? But when a member of your family dies, you're still very much bound to them, even in their death. So what was that excellent example that Hegel gives? Was it that a grave is so highly honored, that thing? Uh, well, often the son keeps his father's remains in the house for three or four years and lives in strictest mourning for that length of time. <laughs> for example, during this time, he sits on no chair, but only a footstool. Just as important as the burial is the upkeep of the gravesite and the annual visit to it. This demonstrates one respect, sorrow and gratitude. And again, this and he says some more stuff as well about burial. This just shows the enduring strength of the family as the glue of the society. Yeah. Even in death, it's yeah. 
it's what is regulating people's lives yeah and i suppose also it's the one way in which spirit can respond against natural death right right it's yeah. like knowing that you will be remembered and revered by your family uh, might be comfort right in your life so you don't think about death because it's yeah. it's not a not that bad of a deal indeed yeah Yes. So we, move, we want to move on to the next thing, next topic. Yep. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. The emperor and his power. Which, uh, and the, uh, <laughs> yeah, there are laws according to which he rules. Hegel, sp Hegel speaks about the laws, which uh, seem to be like laws only in name because yeah. if the monarch wills something else, then that just becomes the law, right? Yeah. Um. this so the yeah so the we i mean this is jumping ahead a little bit mm -hmm. but uh it's makes sense why the education of the emperor or the the heir uh, becomes so important <laughs> because mm -hmm. unless that's their chance to sort of affect things in the state mm -hmm. whereas when the emperor has grown up and is at at command there is really no more much less um, influence on them. Yeah. At, at least much less formation. Right. Because there's no room for discussion once they're emperor because their will is the law. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. So I think something, something interesting to note about Chinese society is that unlike medieval uh, European society, feudal society, he uh, Hegel writes that there is no such aristocracy. So you don't have these pockets of autonomy in the state where different individuals rule over different lands and to a certain extent exercise their individual power over them. Um, it's really just the emperor. Yes. And and whilst there are, what was it like? Uh, Fifteen thousand scholars and twenty thousand military personnel yeah. who are part of the administration. Yeah, they're not. They're they're not really. They're not like. They're not like the equivalent of lords or dukes and whatnot. No, they're, they're really supervisors. Just, they're super. They're they're very expensive supervisors. Powerful supervisors in their own right. Yeah, or officials, right? Yeah, Hegel mentions yeah. often that you know they can incite rebellion, or they can you know they can have some kind of political agitation. Yeah, uh, within their um their political arsenal, but yeah. they don't wield power the way the nobility in European culture would wield power. In contrast to the monarch, yes. yeah. So I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. Um, maybe as a as a comparison, maybe to help us here to to visualize it, maybe we can think of um, Roman governors, right, who are mandated to be overseeing a province mm -hmm. even though they were technically not owners of that province they could they had a lot of power in in that, in that province but they were still subject to a tenure right maybe five yeah. years or something and then it's over right then somebody else takes over and they go off and do something else yeah that comes close to it yeah yeah so this this kind of um people being in charge but not really owning what they're in charge of isn't uncommon mm -hmm. yeah but but maybe it's even it has a more um a greater extreme in um chinese ancient china well i think it has it has a tighter grip right because um, yeah as you said in the form of the governor they are ultimately quite answerable to the senate and yeah whereas the emperor is not i mean just to quote hegel here the emperor alone wields every controlling highest and all pervasive power. Yep. There are laws according to which he rules, but these are no laws that conflict with the will of the monarch, but instead the kind of laws by which all things are maintained in accord with his will. Yeah. So I think this is, I mean, this is it's like absolute power. Pretty much. And, and now we see the macro version of what's essentially happening in the family right 
Nobody exactly. in the family has any real power except the father, has any authority or respect, deference other than the father. But if you zoom out into bigger society, well, all these families are kind of moments of the imperial, um, the imperial institu family. institution, or imp which are themselves, um, you know, moments of the emperor. So everybody is somebody's supervisor, basically. Or everybody is somebody, everybody's an inferior to somebody else, except one. Except for the emperor, yeah. Except for the emperor. Yeah. So you really get this emphasis of the of discrete moments of individuality. I'm just trying to pick out some conceptual uh, schemes here. You really get these, this idea of discrete pockets of individuality that seem to have a universal pull within their own circumscribed sphere. But this is all just relative to a, a higher sphere. Um, and that all this derives all these little, like, like all these little Russian dolls, if you will, gradually yeah. getting bigger and bigger, ultimately derive their essence from the emperor. Yes. It's the paternal outlook of the emperor that dissolves uh, and trickles down society. Yeah. Everything is centered around the emperor. Yeah. And, um, So as you as you mentioned earlier, right? This isn't preventing rebellions and uh, traitors and so and and things like that from happening, right? Mm. I would suppose that the reason why there is this kind of level of organization is to to prevent those things, to stifle those things, but they're not one hundred percent successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, you know, what's the reason for that? Um, so if everything is kind of, you know, um, feeds into the top, mm -hmm. how is it that anything can break at any point? And I think the weakness is exactly the top. I think Hegel, you know, pinpoints that at the end of this section is if there is any kind of um, slack at the top level, well, that trickles down and then you get these cancerous elements. People start thinking of their, thinking their, of their own ideas and so on. Yeah. That's a very good point, yeah. And it fits well with the logical structure because it's from the top that they get their determination. Yeah. Um, uh, so just more, more on that, on the measures against um, rebellion and corruption and so on. Mm -hmm. There does seem to be a lot of thought put into that because these this uh, scholarly class the mandarins are not allowed to exercise authority in which their family live and yeah. they might not acquire property where uh, he holds office so these are very clever means in which kind of to regulate the um, ambition of somebody right don't get yeah. comfortable with your job because you're not supposed to do it for your own sake you're supposed to do it for the service of the emperor basically yeah what's really interesting about uh this section um is that we have this state which is so family structured almost and yet the administration is uh very i mean at least the way hegel paints it and from my own reading on china ancient china it's not as nepotistic as other societies um i mean the fact that to become a mandarin you have to go through an examination process yeah and this is this is a big deal you know uh, when uh, when the british found out about the examination process in in china the chinese uh, empire they started copying it, and that's why to this day British civil servants are called mandarins. Um, really? It's, yes. Shit. Yes. Um, high-ranking British civil servants, of course. Uh, you know the very yeah. best. <laughs> yeah, uh, and so it's interesting that in the administration you have this almost meritocratic, uh, not explicitly nepotistic structure, 
uh, that's designed to organize society and to avoid, as you say, you know, self-interest, really, um, to try and keep the peace by avoiding self-interest, by sidestepping the problems of self-interest when you have people in power. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it's a society that's so structured around the family as well. I mean, yeah. you could easily imagine a situation where such a highly, such a society could have easily been bathed in nepotism and corruption. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's interesting that there is this opposition, this contrast between the way the administration is selected and with the way the rest of society is organized. Yeah, it's most it's almost like they split the whole issue of self-interest and personal ambition and person you know inclinations into two. So in your job for the state, you are a perfect servant, you do yeah. your duty diligently, but at home you can get to be the emperor. And do as yeah. you like. So they just like a, a they just separated the two. They, they put them into extremes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Hegel doesn't say this explicitly. But that's what I'm getting out of this. Yeah. So at work, you're uh, you're Marcus Aurelius. When you come home, you turn into Caligula. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> and that way is a nice kind of dialectical reciprocity between the two elements, two extremes, because. There's nothing. There's no nothing lacking in your life because you get to you get to fulfill, to fulfill both both ends. Right. Yeah. Well, exactly. Presumably, yeah. These mandarins would have their family lives where they would be probably beholden to their fathers. I, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add to that? On this section, no. About the mandarins, no. I mean, uh, we've already mentioned that the merit meritocratic element. There's no Hegel mentions there's no birthrights. Right. Um, yeah. No castes. Right. There isn't the kind of that yeah. kind of structure set in place to limit people from the start, apart from them belonging to a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, as we've alluded to already, it's the um, since everything is kind of feeds upwards, and all authority and self determination is gained from from the top, then that top element becomes extremely important. And in effect, you know, morals, uh, morality kind of has its source from the top. Because mm -hmm. if the emperor is, um, the, his will aligns like with the law, well, then their will is basically morality in a yeah. way. And the, the, the law reflects their morality. Yeah. So it becomes really important that their morality is, is uh, you know, good and proper, yeah. which is paradoxical. Yeah. You know, wants to think about it, but let's just mm, put that why? under the rug. Why? Well, if somebody's will, well, if the law aligns with somebody's will, mm -hmm. right, and there cannot be a, a distinction between the two at the highest level, mm -hmm. then the education of that will doesn't matter in effect, because that will just is what's moral. Why would right. you want to change that will? Mm -hmm. The only reason why they would want to educate anyone or this this will is because they are presupposing a higher morality. Yeah, but they cannot make that explicit or admit it to themselves. Interesting. Okay, so I think right. that this is one of the parts in which, like, latent contradictions in ancient societies of why they are doomed. Mm. Yeah, they must have something about children, though, and parents, because it's 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 the child before they become emperor, right? That is that needs to be educated, right? Yes. Um, but, but it'd be interesting. Once, it's still, it's still a yeah. kind of yeah, it's it's dodgy, you know. 
It is dodgy. It is dodgy. Yeah. Because actually, it's the will of the existing emperor, presumably, that is going to mold the future will. Right? Because the existing emperor is the father of the future emperor. Mold in that maybe in a certain way, but not in a day-to-day -day way. You know, mm. get learning the languages, the grammar, the various riding horses, etc. Right? So they, they probably have a legion of instructors and teachers who teach them, yeah. you know, all the all this stuff, history, etc. Mm -hmm. But maybe in terms of like statehood ambitions, yeah, they can learn that from their dad. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so this is sort of the third and final important point for Hegel, this idea that the moral condition of the emperor is fundamental. Yes. Um, and this is what he discusses in this, in this final section. Sort of, he gives some examples of very successful lines of emperors. Yeah. He talks about, I think it's the Manchu emperors as yeah. having been exceptionally successful, producing great moral emperors um top and level he, emperors top level emperors yeah um i mean and then he gives examples so uh, just on this on this idea of a very good emperor on page 231 at the very top he talks about their depiction and he says the ideal rulers are portrayed as moral plastic shapes that are all of a piece like the artworks of the ancients Mm -hmm. in the way that we represent to ourselves the ideals of the ancients they are figures who express in their every feature a unity of harmony a unity or harmony of character dignity circumspection and beauty yes so there's just this idea of the emperor as as, as this ideal to strive for uh they're almost not even a real person um, certainly no yeah yeah it's like the uh the uh, the ideal of the ideal ruler is somebody who is fully committed to their role. Right. If you're emperor of China, you don't get to be you know yourself, have your own kind of funny pastime thing or you know funny quirks or whatever. No, no, no. You are supposed to be a moral exemplar, and everything you do has to feed into that. So you you have to be a kind of explicit organic whole. Mm. Uh, in the way a classical artwork is a, com a, a, f a complete reciprocity between content and form and that's a wonderful little tension isn't it at the core that this individual yes. who is the apex of the state yes. is unable to be himself yes he's sort of like a, a detached individual he's some, is in, it is an individual insofar as he's the emperor he's that the single point in which the entire essence of the state is focused. Yes. But he's not himself. No. He's, he's an ideal of, uh, of what he ought to be. Yes. He, he must be. He, his, his own self has to submit itself fully to being this ideal ruler. Yeah. Yeah. And he, in a way, he's kind of under the tyranny of wholeness. Because yes. he can have no part for himself. There's no, there's no pastime you know anything like that <laughs> pastimes or pleasures outside the sphere of their occupations as hegel talks about right no no there's no time for that and and this i think is an echo that still lives on today to in modern states when you think about ministers high ranking government official prime ministers you know we we recognize that they're people that you know they might have interests and so on quirks and so on, but they're not really supposed to in their role as mm. in the occupation. Like, you know, Boris Johnson is not meant to have parties and break the law on his own, you know, uh, yeah. stuff yeah. like that, right? Even though mm -hmm. as a individual, it's perfectly like understandable that stuff like that can happen. And, but it's that the expectation is just like wildly different. Yeah. And uh, when it comes to uh, people high in, high in the state, and I think that's this I ideal rulers still latent in yeah. our in our minds because the state itself needs to have this sacred element to it. Yeah. And that kind of bleeds into its uh, uh, top level people. Yeah. 
I think that's particularly the case with uh, the way people think about the the late queen as well. Um, this idea that she was meant to be an ideal, uh, an ideal of family life, an ideal of duty to the state, and that no one really wanted to know her as she was, but people wanted an ideal to look at. Right. So I think I, th- I think you're very right that 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 thing has very that sort of idea. Of yeah. a leader being this plast being this plastic form and not being a real living thing has definitely continued. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you can just see it in the names of monarchs, right? Mm-hmm. Charles the Third, mm-hmm. um, or right, right. Um, there is a much individual. Amenhotep the Fourth, or whatever, right? Yeah. yeah, they're 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 not even ha- they don't have a like. A name for themselves they're just like uh you know a moment of a list they're yeah. a, an entry in a list basically mm-hmm. yeah, yeah 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 they're just they're moments of the monarchy but who they are specifically is almost uh by the by yeah so th- so this is why i think um that all these uh ancient empires Turn out to have an hourglass shape rather than the pyramid shape. Mm-hmm. So the you know society, the actual society, is uh, you know structured the way it is, uh, with common people and so on at the bottom, and then officials and so on higher up, and then at the very top sits the emperor in this mm-hmm. case. So this is the you know present actual society, but the emperor themselves, being a moment of some history. They turn out to be, you know, have a whole whole range of things they have to submit themselves to, mm-hmm. and I think that's how, how the top level kind of invert becomes inverted, and where right. the emperor, in a um, reflected sense, when you think of it conceptually, uh, actually is the least individual, individualistic mm-hmm. of everybody in the in the pyramid. Yeah, even very though all good. all power goes to them. Yeah, very nice. You almost feel sorry for them for a bit. Almost, almost feel sorry for them for, for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> this this lines up nicely with um, Hegel's discussion of the master master and slave dialectic in the phenomenology, where right. the master just turns into the slave, mm-hmm. and yeah. that's a nice um, logic uh, or exp- logical expression of what we can kind of intimate here. Mm-hmm. I guess there's also something to be said about the the individual universal thing insofar as the individual is the universal for Hegel and the emperor being the individual does not mean that he can just be himself. What it means is for him to be, it actually means he is the embodiment of the universal of the state. Uh, Yes, but uh, his particularity as, as we've discussed is completely erased. Exactly, or, yeah, exactly, but yeah. submerged, right? Yeah, suppressed. So it's an individual that is completely submerged in universality. Yeah. Um, Looking from the, yeah, from the actual pyramid, that is what it looks like. But yeah. I would want to say, in the inverted pyramid, as I'm calling it now, I'm just making this up as I go. No, that's very uh, good. <laughs> uh, he is actually a particular. Right, his his okay. individuality yes. is submerged in particularity because he's a moment of many other rulers that mm-hmm. came before him, and there will be others after him because it's part of his yeah. duty to make sure of that happening. So yeah. he's kind of locked in in the particularity there. Mm-hmm. And all these particulars kind of seem to be almost identical to each other, right? It is not significant. That they're different particulars per se. No, if anything, what what they should do is more of the same. Yeah. Right. More glory to the state. More exactly, land yeah. conquered. More wealth. More. Just more. Right. <laughs> Which is kind of banal. Yeah. And this yeah. also hints at the cyclicality of this kind of society, uh, and not a real development, historical development, as we discussed in the earlier sections. Mm-hmm. And then I guess we might say, uh, this is how Hegel concludes this section. He sort of 
makes explicit the fact that because the entire essence of the state is focused in this one individual, that if they don't do well, the state will not do well. Yes. And so just to quote Hegel here on page 231, if the emperor does not watch over the state, then the whole comes apart. For there is no lawful power, no explicitly formed conscience of the officials for what ought to be the law is something determined from the top down. Yeah. So because there's no other, there's no other nobility, there's no, there's no one else to try and uh, maintain things. If the, if, uh, if the emperor loses control for a bit, then everything just falls apart. Yeah. And, and that's uh, why the education of the emperor is so important. That's how you yeah. it. Yeah, and this is like a massive risk, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the society just <laughs> is betting everything it's got on <laughs> one guy, one dude. Every 25 and years. And they're betting that game. one dude to not be a dude, okay? Yeah. We're going to, it's like, you, you're you in charge, but just you, the only need thing, the only thing you need to absolutely need to do is not be yourself. <laughs> You just 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 be good just be you know perfectly good be moral yeah. upstanding good ruler etc but don't be yourself and yet at the same time so is this intention with the idea that the law is the will of the emperor how can it be the will of the emperor and yet the individuality of the emperor is defaced how do we are those things intention is defaced effaced uh removed it's it's meant to be ignored um the emperor is not oh, meant see. to be himself he's meant right. to be a video of himself and yet it is his will that is the law the culture the morality of the empire of the state yeah good is that yeah, you, a little bit i think so yeah mm. yeah that seems like um Yeah, well, so it's because if they do something that is actually immoral and would, you know, be irrational or not beneficial to the state to do, there's no way they can attack him. They would just have to dogmatically take that as, yep, that's just a will, because it's the emperor. Right. I mean, right? you get it. There's no room for criticism. No, there is no room for criticism yeah. because there's no room for the emperor to be an individual. So I guess, I guess, yeah. And yet they are individuals and that it must necessarily be expressed. And the way that is dealt with is by putting it as just, nope, it's the, it just becomes, you know, uh, morality straight away. It becomes accepted, even though it's bad. Yeah. Yeah. So on the one hand, well, I guess maybe you might try to reconcile it by saying that if the emperor does well, then his will as the morality of the nation is this ideal plastic will because he's not allowing his uh, individual caprices to come into the equation. If he does well. If he does well. And what if he doesn't? Well, from an external perspective, perspective he does poorly because he allows his individuality to sort of corrupt the morality of the state but from within the system as you correctly said it's fine obviously yeah from within the system you it can't be criticized because the will is the law um yeah yeah, yeah. but i think that within the system this perspective is actually more honest than the outside perspective of Splitting the two, mm -hmm. uh, uh, because the way it's laid out is just there's no way for the um, for the emperor to suppress their individuality, and yet they must. Mm -hmm. So that's a contradiction. Yeah, it's a huge risk society takes to bet everything on the one individual to not be themselves, and yet. To, it cannot be stopped because it's part of a human being to, you know, be, be free basically. But it, mm -hmm. the way that state and society structure that 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 cannot be, um, reconciled. Uh, yeah, fulfilled, reconciled. Yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, that is more honest. You're right. 
yeah but there's no way in which i think there could be a good or bad emperor without detaching the law from the individual that that kind of uh criterion would have to change i mean if the state sort of descends into rioting Can the emperor be blamed for it? Nope. So is the writer's problem. No, I, I think that's that's it's mm. uh, it's correct because I think this is what must follow if you align the law perfectly yeah. with the emperor's person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. Uh, that is, much, yeah, and that is much, and that's a much more honest expression of the of the tension. Yeah, and so you you cannot criticize it. No. because of that uh, criterion yeah if you separated that the law is different from the emperor yes then you may quite may, may uh criticize them but then you have a whole different state yeah the the basic fundamental dna of the state is completely changed yeah wouldn't be the ancient chinese state as we are reading about it here no no that's really good yeah so in 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 a, in the way of having the emperor aligned completely with the law is another fact uh, example of just how immediate the state is because the because contradiction it, hasn't been made explicit yeah and it's on the face of it it's simpler mm -hmm. right? why mm -hmm. think of some great superstructure above and beyond the emperor the authority is there the actuality yeah, yeah and the law is are you know in and through that actuality right why create a separation of powers which complicates the uh the structure yeah, why think of morality as this otherworldly cosmic thing? It's here, right now, in the yeah. person of the emperor. In Whatever the they're doing is good for all of us. Yeah, very good. I'm convinced. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so we should see that this immediacy starts breaking apart in later um, historical uh, civilizations we look at. Yeah, uh, that's what we should expect. You should expect that. Yeah. But so should far is huge risk and i think that human beings being the way they are this um risk of rioting and corruption is inevitable uh and and hegel also points to it in the end of this section where he says you know it doesn't need to be a you know a drastic thing it could mm -hmm. be that the emperor is overly trustworthy in some of their advisors mm, right yeah Right, uh, a faith or confidence of the monarch in his associates, ministers, and courtiers. Something like that. That's enough. And, and that's and that's really true to the system. It's because the emperor stops trusting that his will is the law and starts delegating or starts yeah. trusting other people's ideas about what the law should be, that the state leads into decline. But even so, that is not in contradiction with with his you know was emperor if he no, wants to if he wants to, <laughs> if he wants to grant you know authority and trust to others to do the job he can so long as yeah so long so as long as they don't actually become the emperor yeah exactly i think that yeah he can as do long as they have no real power yeah yeah as long yeah. as they're just borrowing right or acting in his name yeah so long as they're just moments of his will yeah it's fine yeah but i guess this activity is the activity that leads into the next moment the um the diminution of power into other particulars even yeah. though it doesn't immediately threaten the identity of will and law i guess this is the thing that will gradually all that this is sort of the the logical development that will eventually happen the particularization yeah. of the individual yes and uh, i don't yeah. know yeah, and I suppose another thing is, you know, to think just how impractical it is to think of all of the power actually being with the emperor, because they can't do everything. Well, that's the thing as well, right? Yeah. So, you know, people can't help being people. So, you know, a very good Mandarin will think, you know, I, I've done all the work. This emperor isn't doing anything. I'm the one that's actually uh, organizing the uh, the grain supplies this year. Right. I should be emperor. Why don't I have land? Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Um, but just the but the fact of organization is that some people do some things that others do other things. So what is it that the emperor actually 
does mm -hmm. right other than to facilitate you know keep together the 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 structure yeah right he, he almost now seems as just an uh an empty symbol yeah um and empty just because all of the essence has gone into maintaining the whole of the structure around him yeah um well, so so all the authority goes to the emperor, but the emperor has to dole it all out straight away, right? Immediately. Because, you know, I don't know anything about grain uh, shipments and logistics and all that. I need other people to to sort that out and people who yeah. know mathematics and says etc. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a funny way of yes, everybody's feeding the emperor with as the, the apex of authority, but at the same time, that authority has to go out again yeah and so it's just a question of you know of when not of what of uh, if there will be excessive confidence or and so on in associates and ministers and courtiers yeah because the because the emperor has to and as hegel puts it the sort of slackening sex sets in an easy slide into moral slackness can engulf everything that's beautiful yeah but it's 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 impossible to maintain yeah it's because it, how how do people it's funny to think of how people organize themselves in this way as to sort of deny their particularity and humanity to that level mm. i mean what's especially amazing then is just how old it is yeah and how long it lasted that's all the more impressive um I guess that's the power of immediacy. Yeah, you know, you get a, you get first on the scene, you get like a, a, a extra dips. <laughs> wow. Okay. I think uh, that's all I have to say on this. Yeah, I think I'm uh, I'm good too. All right then. So for for our next, excellent, uh, we got we got a lot more out of that than I expected. <laughs> Indeed, we did. So next time we have uh, the exactly the moral sphere, subjective freedom yeah. and violation. So I think, um, uh, based from that subtitle, I'm guessing Hegel will dig out more of the logical consequences and implications of this. Right. Yeah. I imagine I'll be right. All right then. Well, uh, st stick with us for next time when we we'll get to this. Yes. Make sure to join us again and leave questions and comments, please, below. We'd love to know what you think. Yes, right. we, we would we'd love to indeed. It, it, why, like, why did... You know, did did human society have to start out like this? Is this a logical point to think of ourselves historically? Is Hegel right about that? Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of questions mm. to be asked about this, right? And you know, why did it break down? Why didn't it work? Because it cannot be something that comes from outside that breaks it down. It it has to break down from within. Right. That's the point. So, yeah, some latent contradictions. Yeah. I yeah, so what do you that. think about that contradiction? Because we've, we've picked out a few contradictions so far. What do you think about them? Well, I don't think I think beyond what I've already said. No, that, was a, that was a rhetorical question to our listeners. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, I, I, I always want to know what you think anyway. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a long day. It has. All, All right, right, then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.